Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. I'm uh, going to talk with Tom Yamachika here on Talking Packs with Tom about the uh, fiscal condition of the state. They're calling this uh, state financial condition still dismal. And I would add, been getting worse. Uh, we got an F from Truth in Accounting, which is a nonprofit on the mainland that looks into the relative fiscal positions of various states. And Hawaii got an F. So we're going to talk to uh, Tom today about uh, why that happened. Uh, how we could have avoided it, how we can avoid it now, and what happens if we don't avoid it. Wow. Is, is this six hours? That's all we have for this discussion. Ready, Tom? <laughs> we can try. We have to kind of you know, get the high points of this. And thank you for having me on the show, Jay. Uh, this uh, uh, report comes out from Truth, Truth in Accounting called Financial State of the States. It comes out, I think, every year. And uh, with the, the report we're talking about is for the fiscal year 2021, uh, and it compared published uh, compared published financial information from all the states for fiscal year 2020. So uh, we got to remember at this point in time, uh, the information was being gathered when we were in kind of the thick of the pandemic, uh, because the you know, the fiscal year 2020 year end is June 30th, 2020. Um, and we got an F that was the grade that happened to be given to the bottom 10 states, which were from numbers 41 through 50, were New York, California, Vermont, Kentucky, Delaware, notice Hawaii hasn't been mentioned yet, uh, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Illinois, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So Connecticut was on the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. And we we made, I think, 46th. But this is not something that came up in the middle of the pandemic. We've been, this is a trend that's been going on in Hawaii for quite some time, isn't it? Of course. Um, well, the, the way the, uh, the scoring was determined is that the financial accounting, uh, I'm sorry, uh, truth in accounting looked at the, uh, the uh, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR, uh, that the that the, the state uh, budget and finance department puts out every year. It's an, it's audited, uh, and uh, they said, okay, uh, let's first look at the number of or the amount of assets that we have. So it's about, it's about thirty billion dollars in assets, and they took away capital assets and restricted assets because those, you know, those can't really be used to pay bills. So uh, when the capital assets and restricted assets were de deducted, we had $6.5 billion left to pay bills. And our total bills, uh, which, you know, are not long-term debts, but, uh, you know, bills we have to pay uh, in, in, the, in the, you know, short and medium term, uh, were $24.5 billion. The shortfall divided by the number of taxpayers we have here yields about $37,000 of shortfall per taxpayer. That include women and children? Sure does. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe not so much children, but the, but the women definitely. Well, um, you know, this goes back to a program that ThinkTech did uh, 10, 15 years ago about the same issue. Well, you know, why weren't we paying our bills? And at the time, the employee's retirement system was something like $12 billion. This is during Abercrombie, um, $12 billion in the hole, and we weren't paying it. And that was only one of a number of things. And the estimates uh, for the total of, um, you know, uh, uh, un, un, unsatisfied, um, unliquidated, both liquidated and unliquid, unsatisfied liabilities was something around $40 billion. I don't, I don't know what that number is now, but this is this report is consistent with it. Let's, let's talk about, um, you know, the nonprofit though. Is, is this a credible nonprofit? Is this a, a nonprofit that is the, um, what is it, truth in accounting nonprofit respected around the country? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, we've been, you know, citing it for a number of years as has, you know, a number of our, uh, sister nonprofits like the you know, the Tax Foundation of in, in the mainland and uh, uh, other 
you know, other nonprofits who are concerned about such things. So uh, I, I don't, I, I don't know how to answer, you know, the, the okay, question well. that you asked, but what I can say is that you know this, uh, these figures have been circulating around now in the press and otherwise for a while. Mm. And, you know what? Uh, what strikes me so ironic about this is that in an election year, you expect a little spending. You know where uh, political officials want to gain popularity and thus votes for the election. Right? That's just part of our democracy. But this year, to make it the the twenty twenty two session. We were really being extravagant. We spent a lot of money, um, and uh, why we're spending the money? We're we're going in the hole um, on fiscal on, on on fiscal stability. So, can you talk about how much we spent this year and whether that was appropriate? Well, um, whether it's appropriate is is kind of a policy decision, but let, but I can give you an idea of how much we spent uh, as you. As you probably know, we have a uh, uh, a tax rebate coming up, or that that's been going on since I think August, and uh, and they're still waiting for paper to print the checks on. But but what's a tax rebate in the state of Hawaii? Uh, it's three hundred dollars per exemption for those less, making less than one hundred thousand per person, uh, and uh, hundred dollars. That's because we had a surplus, and the Constitution requires. That if we have a surplus, we we pay the tax, pay it back to the taxpayers. Uh, not not entirely. I mean, that's what the, the constitutional provision first read, but but now uh, they can satisfy that requirement by either giving some back to the taxpayers or uh, making contributions to the rainy day fund or making contributions to the pension fund. And and this bill, uh, which is. Um, uh, Senate Bill 514, Act 115, did both. So they uh, provided the, you know, the tax rebates, which are supposed to cost about $250 million. It uh, put down $500 million to the Rainy Day Fund and $300 million to the Pension Accumulated Fund uh, to pay down some of these uh, unfunded liabilities. And then, as you as you recall from other discussions we've had in the past, uh, the, our legislators also appropriated six hundred million for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. So that was, was an op that was an optional thing. That was a matter of their decision to do that. They were not obligated to do that. All right. Well, they they weren't obligated to do any of the above. Okay. I mean, when they were faced with the constitution requirement in the past. They said, "Okay, one dollar per, you know, one dollar per return," and they did that for a number of years. Mm. When and that's when they had no other choice. Mm. So at least, at least this time, the um, the rebate's more substantial, uh, and they've, you know, they they've committed, uh, you know, you, you add up the six hundred and the five hundred and the three hundred and the two fifty, um, and and you have, you know, a billion dollars and a half. Well, I don't understand why uh, when in what, 2020 or 2021, we had a shortfall per taxpayer of $37,000. That's a lot of bread. Um, uh, in 2022, uh, we are so lush uh, that we can afford to spend that kind of money and not pay our debts, not reduce the 37000 per taxpayer. I don't understand that. Oh, well, I think we did a little bit because most of the uh, the shortfall that was identified in the Truth and Accounting Report uh, was from the uh, you know, other post-employment benefits. You know, the the when 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 state workers come into our system, we promise them stuff. We promise them a pension, and there's a pension plan. So it's called the Defined Benefit Plan. That's the ERS, Employee Retirement System, and we also promise them health care. Uh, and that's sometimes called the EUTF for the Employer Union Trust Fund. And uh, when in, in the old days they promised lifetime health care uh, you know, for for state retirees, lifetime, and that's that could be a long time. Yeah, that's sweet. A lot of people work for the state for that reason. Yeah, uh, and so we've made promises. And uh, it just so happened that the legislature that made the promises 
isn't the one who's paying off on these liabilities. Mm -hmm. Sweet, right? I mean, you can you can be real nice to voters, and you, didn't, you don't have to deal with the aftermath. Uh, and so, and when you happened, add to that that we probably have too many state state employees, it becomes even more ironic. Well, I, I'm not I'm not blaming the employees. Okay. No, 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 no. Uh, let, let me let, let me be themselves. clear. And 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 somebody and, had to they, hire them, Tom. Yeah, uh, but I, I'm and and you know when the the print. Uh, article that I'm, you know, talking about came out. You know, there were some employees who, who took personal offense, and and I and I had to explain. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, hardworking state employees in general caused this. Uh, it's it was a matter of the promises that were made and, uh, and the the follow through or lack thereof, uh, of of our lawmakers and. Uh, and again, you know, going back to the Truth and Accounting Report, they said uh, that according to the state's audited financial statements, uh, we had 10.4 billion of unfunded pension benefits and 9.4 billion of unfunded health care benefits. That's 20 million. That's 20 billion dollars right there, out of the 24 and a half that we said uh, need to be shouldered by, you know, taxpayers in the short and medium term. Okay, so 20, you know, that, that accounts for 20 out of the 24 and a half billion, which, which basically is the problem right there. Yeah, when it goes back to that program I told you about where the estimates uh, were uh, higher than that in terms of uh, yeah, so, liquidated so, so, and unliquidated unfunded liabilities. Yeah, so when you look at, for example, these, um, uh, estimates of you know how well these benefits are funded, okay, which which is what they are. They're estimates. Um, there are, of course, some areas that that are debatable, and that and most most notable of which is, uh, you have a stream of of liabilities in the future. You know the healthcare benefits and pension payments and such, um, and to, to get to the present value of what they are, you need a discount rate. And that is, you know, typically an interest rate that you get on the assets that, that uh, you know, that, that you have in the, in the fund that is going to, you know, pay for these things. So uh, for, for a long time, they were using, I think, an 8% a discount rate that was man mandated by statute. Uh, but, the, but the fund assets weren't getting any close, any, anywhere close to that. So, and... Uh, uh, compounding the problem was when they did get returns on those assets that were, you know, huge. The legislature pounced on them, saying, "Oh, we we can find better uses for this money, so we're going to raid the uh, we're going to raid the, uh, uh, um, uh, the 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 fund that provides for other post employment benefits, and we're going to invest in something else." And that's, that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can't do that if you've if you've got a uh, a rate of return that you want. Uh, if you stomach all, if if you just eat the losses and take away all the benefits, because you, of course you know the market goes up and down, you'll you'll never get to the rate of return. So if you can stop that bad behavior, and, and I think, you know, maybe uh, uh, at, at least, you know, we were trying in the, uh, in around the, the, the 2013 timeframe uh, to have some more fiscal responsibility. It, you know, before the show, we were talking about, you know, the Abercrombie administration and Calvert Young, who was then the director of finance. One of the, one of the initiatives Calvert put through uh, was uh, there was a law in 2013 that 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 basically said, look, if you uh, if if the state can't meet uh, its annual obligations to fund the pension plans, or if the counties can't, uh, then they're going to sequester things. Like um, for the what state, that, what does that mean? For the state, uh, if 
if they didn't appropriate enough money for the pension plans and, and the health care plans, they would sequester the general excise tax. What does that mean? They, they, would, they would take whatever was needed from the general excise tax before it came in and could fund anything else. Mm. That's pretty dramatic. Yeah, but but the but the uh, but the problem is uh, that this was just a law, right? Uh, lawmakers could amend the law if they if they so chose, mm -hmm. and sometimes they did. <laughs> Let me uh, throw some more irons in the fire here. Um, first, first of all, um, um, it seems to me that uh, we, you know we we have all these these bills that call it depreciation for maintenance and repair of infrastructure around the state. Um, and and uh, I think everybody will agree that at least in Oahu, the roads need work um, and they haven't been getting that work. This is a long time. They haven't been getting that work. And I'm sure to a moral certainty that there are other, you know, uh, infrastructure uh, facilities that are in similar circumstance. So while we're spending money like we did at a rapid rate uh, in 2022, um, we're, we're really not fixing the infrastructure. And then let me throw another iron on top of that. You know, uh, Joe Biden has, uh, you know, pushed his uh, infrastructure bill through. A lot of people are sitting waiting. A lot of organizations and government itself sitting and waiting for that money. They're going to spend this money, uh, and, it, and at least theoretically, it's a lot of money. Uh, of course, that, you know that could that could change dramatically if Congress changes its uh, configuration in a few weeks. Yeah. Well, let's 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 start with the roads and bridges. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, by and large, the roads and bridges are, are are funded separately from state government. We have something called the Highway Fund, mm -hmm. and and we have that there um, as a federal requirement. Uh, so, so, so the feds can uh, can kick in federal transportation money and help us, uh, you know, build, maintain, or whatever, uh, you know, the, the the roads, bridges, and and stuff that's out there. Does that work? Because what we heard from Joe Biden not too long ago, and you know, what you and I must have heard from other sources, is that the federal infrastructure support hasn't worked. And in fact, there's infrastructure all over the country, uh, which has decayed and deteriorated, and it hasn't been maintained and repaired. There's bridges falling into rivers. Uh, why doesn't it, I mean, isn't the same process happening right here in Hawaii? You know, well, of course it is. I mean, the, 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 the fact that we have money doesn't necessarily mean we're spending it. And, and, for, and that is a problem that we've had for a long time. Um, in in the 2010 time frame, I remember that uh, when when Jill Takuda uh, was was Ways and Means Chair, she's you know running for congressional office now. Uh, when she was Ways and Means Chair, she had some hearings during the summertime, of, I think around the the, the 2010 time frame, and, and she took the Department of Transportation to task for not spending the money that the feds were giving them. Why would you not spend the money? The feds were giving you. It could be one of several reasons. You could have permitting delays. Uh, you could have just ineptness. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we know about permitting delays. And yes, we, we do. We have a kind of virus about permitting delays, and I guess in a general sense, they're really not justified, um, but they continue to happen despite all the pressure. Um, to expedite permitting process. Yeah, and then uh, we have a kind of a clunky procurement system uh, that we have to uh, comply with in order to, you know, spend state money to to get stuff done, especially in you know the big contracts. So that has to kind of, you know, be dealt with, and and it takes time to go through all the steps. So I mean that's that's stuff that was cited by the department. How much is true? I, I don't really know, but um, and and I think since that time, uh, the Department of Transportation has caught up a bit in you know spending these uh, the, you know these federal monies as as well as the state 
uh, appropriated dollars as, uh, as well. And like I said, it, it comes from a kind of a, spe a separate fund. We have a uh, we have the gas tax. That's the primary driver of the fund. And and the and the gas tax has has had its own problems, because with the you know the transition to you know hybrid and uh, electric vehicles, uh, people aren't buying so much gas anymore. Okay, well, that, you know, it really all it takes us back to the fact that we have a and have had a huge fiscal problem in terms of balancing the budget. Um, and although the Constitution says we're supposed to have a balanced budget, that's, that's imperfect. Um, but worse, you know, we have bills we haven't paid. We have liabilities we have not, we have not paid. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I hear it from you, Tom, and you're a very nice person and good for the Tax Foundation of Hawaii and, for that matter, good for truth in accounting. But I don't hear it as a platform point. We just got through a season of campaigning. I don't hear it as a platform point. Why is it not a platform point? Uh, I, uh, there are, I think, several possible reasons for that. Uh, my speculation, and and that's what that's all it is, is that it's a really, really difficult issue to crack. Um, several governors in the past have been confronted with this. Uh, We've made a little progress, maybe, but not much. It's a big problem, and and it's it's kind of exacerbated not only by you know some of the other issues that we've talked about, like the the procurement system and civil service in general, uh, you know the civil service system in general. Um, but but there's also kind of the usual uh, clunkiness that comes with a large bureaucracy, which is what we have. Well, nobody, nobody wants to step up and fix it. Um, I, you know, and, and if it wasn't a platform point uh, in the campaigns, uh, especially gubernatorial campaigns this year, <clears throat> it's not likely to be a high attention point in the administrations to follow. Right? Well, unless, unless you know, the the the, the you know the people, the constituents, uh, start telling them that you know, this is a problem. So. Well, but you, as you said, it's complex, and the average person, the average voter, the average constituent, uh, he, she doesn't really understand how serious this is, um, or even how we got here, uh, or where it goes from here. I mean, this is very arcane stuff. So they're not likely to bang on anybody's door about it. They have other fish to fry, other agendas, uh, other points of in, interest, you know, um, to work on. When the legislature opens in the middle of January, people are not going to be pounding on, on doors and walking the halls to argue about fiscal policy that affects everybody. They're going to be walking the halls about their own points of self-interest. Am I right? For a large, you know, to a large extent, that's right. Um, we, we do tell them and other people tell them that you got to worry about this. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they understand, sometimes they don't. But that's why you know that um, people like you and me are here, right? To uh, to to try to help the public gain understanding, to help the legislators gain understanding. You know, to, of of the you know the humongous problems that we are facing. Yeah, I mean, talk about homelessness, for example. <clears throat> That's a, a an unliquidated liability. We know we're going to have to spend a lot of money on it. We know that. We don't know how much or yeah. when. Um, and so, you know, that's just going to grow, and it's going to become a, another hole in the boat. It's a great concern. At the same time, our our state's economy on the other side of the, the ledger, our state's economy is not doing all that well. There's a lot of businesses who have folded in. Uh, in COVID, and there's not a lot of businesses that have that have been generated, you know, entrepreneurial activity uh, during COVID. And so uh, we, we we it's not like we can look forward to uh, uh, an enormous prosperity in the state of Hawaii. What's more, is uh, you know while we have these unfunded liabilities and while we have the prospect of recession, and it was in the 
the paper yesterday again about that prospect of national recession. Um, and of course, we're affected by real estate and mortgage mortgage rates have gone up, as you know, and that affects the you know the um, the, the real estate market. Um, all of that considered, we're not doing much to actually mm, encourage, incentivize uh, the development, the expansion of our economy. And when, when you do that, what happens is people leave town because they can't, they can't get jobs they like, they, they can't buy houses they like, and so forth. They can't- Yeah, we talked about that last, last session. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no incentives going on for technology, agriculture, uh, and other sectors that might improve, you know, the, the, the state's economy, thus the, um, you know, gross income for the state, thus, um, you know, the, the fiscal, the availability of the tax base, you know. And so my question to you is out of Charles Dickens. I don't think, I don't think we talked about Charles Dickens last time, Tom. If we did, tell me now. <clears throat> Charles Dickens wrote, um, you know, the Christmas Carol, right? And he, and he talked about Ebenezer Scrooge. And he talked about Jacob Marley. Uh, and he talked about Bob Cratchit. Remember those guys? Well, of course. And one of the elements of the Christmas Carol is the ghost of Christmas future. Uh, when um, Ebenezer Scrooge is forced to look into the future, he sees enough there to make him change his attitude about, about, about the, 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 you know, what's happening right now. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you about the ghost of Christmas future. If we do not incentivize our economy, um, if a fair number of our you know, uh, graduates leave town, um, if, if, if our businesses don't do well and, and fail, and uh, if we don't pay our liabilities here and we, you know, we continue from 37,000 negative per taxpayer to some higher number, uh, and we spend the money in the wrong place, and we, and we bank on federal assistance that may or may not come in the change of administrations and the change of the, you know, configuration of Congress, um, what then? What happens to Hawaii if all these things, um, you know, are, are part of the ghost of our Christmas future? Well, um, I, I think that the main problem that we have now is that the one thing that that Scrooge did is he believed the ghost of Christmas future, and that caused him to, you know, modify his outlook on the present. We can, you know, paint these visions for lawmakers, but the question is whether they'll believe them. And if they don't, you know, we can we can kind of uh, count on more of the same and more of the same and more of the same. Um, but we're trying to we're trying to tell them, look, you know, the ghost of Christmas future isn't lying to you. We can see the population leaving. We can see um, economic indicators like, you know, those that are referenced in this report going, you know, going down. Um, and lawmakers can't be expected to fix the problem by saying, ah, we'll just raise taxes some more, which is what they've done in the past. I think there's, there's a limit and, and we're, we're reaching that limit and the reason I say we're reaching that limit is because, because you because you can see people getting on those planes and getting the heck out. That's been yeah. documented by you know ourselves and others to to a great degree. It's in our census data. It's been happening a long time, uh, but I think um, you know it can be accelerated. I think it is being accelerated by the, these very factors we're. we're... I'm talking about and and you know when you when you do the switch out on population you say well let's see we'll have a lot of people uh, who buy um, three four million dollar condos uh, near the water um, but we'll have a lot of people in the middle class who leave town you have a you have a different Hawaii at the end of the day um, the ones who are um, you know buying the expensive condos they may not live here uh, they may not work here um, it's just a different demographic. It's a different fiscal char character, so so to speak. And if you take out the uh, you know young kids who might start businesses and be entrepreneurs and 
and build up, you know, the, sort of develop the, the state's economy to a more robust condition, um, what happens then? You have all these, all these, you have real estate building condos, but you don't have the, the businesses that, that support the actual economy. I, I'm not sure how that works. Maybe you have a better handle on it than I do, but I, if I look into the ghost of Christmas future and I, I see through the keyhole what life will be like, well, what will it be like? Do you have a vision of that, Tom? Well, um, I don't, you know, I don't, the, the ghost never came to me, uh, but I, I really do hope it, uh, it, it visits the, uh, you know, those who will be leaving our state. Yeah, well, well, what would you tell them in terms of, you know, there's a lot of issues here. And if you said, well, let's, let's do a bill in the legislature in 2023 on every single issue we've talked about, boy, you'd be busy. That's not going to happen. But if there was one or two bills that were most important, to deal with this, um, you know, shortfall, to deal with our um, grade of F on the national um, the national uh, survey, uh, what would you tell them? What's the say one or two things that they should be doing to address this? Sure, I mean we we should be, you know, uh, very disciplined when it comes to our our fiscal situation. I mean. Uh, we we talked about Calvert Young before in the uh, in the 2013 legislation that was signed into law by Abercrombie to achieve just that. We got to we have to take that seriously. You know we 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 can't be uh, legislating deviations from that all the time. Uh, we we have to be serious. We have to pay down our debts. Uh, we have to come into a situation where you know like like most of us have mortgages. Uh, we, we live in our houses and we have mortgages and, and we don't, you know, worry about the, uh, you know, the 300000 or $400,000 we owe at the moment because we're making our payments on time. So that, that may be kind of like the attitude that our, our, our lawmakers are, are thinking about, but we, we do need to impress on them some consciousness of what the, what the big picture actually is. I noticed you didn't mention anything about incentivizing entrepreneurship. Does that fit at the top of the list also? Well, I don't know because um, there, are, there are those who will argue that incentivizing anything uh, is detrimental to the economy because it um, inhibits free market, which, uh, and, and they argue that that's, that's what we really need uh, to get us out of this mess. So, and, and uh, uh, when you start on, on the incentives track, then you kind of get into things like, you know, incentivizing taro, incentivizing um, uh, cesspools or cesspool removal incentivizing you know this that and the other thing it just and it, it just uh gets into so much complexity it's unbelievable well these things are problems that can be solved with good policy cesspool removal to me is not is not an investment in the future cesspool removal is not uh, an investment in our economy or our youth um or you know long-term prospects for expanding the tax base so you make a decision about what you want to incentivize and you incentivize industries and activities that that your experts and there must be some out there somewhere if they're not here in Hawaii maybe maybe they're in Cincinnati there must be somewhere who can tell us what activities uh, will give us the greatest bang for our buck we're investing in ourselves and so I mean to the extent that people say um, I don't want to give any money to those young kids you know it's just they're spoiled anyway. Let them go make a buck themselves. Let them enjoy the free market and, and suffer. Um, I say to them um, that, you know, we, we have to manage our economy. And in an island state, uh, a free market may not be the solution. In an island state where there are lobbyists walking the halls every January, um, doing self-interest, but not doing um, fiscal policy that actually helps the whole state and incentive policy that actually hold. We have run into this problem year after year and decade after decade 
where we have not done proper incentives for industries that that could be a, a, a valid and useful uh, investment. Yeah, cer certainly what we have to do is is to figure what we're what we're good at as as a state and with the population that we now have and and work toward making it better. Uh, have we done that? I don't think so. No, I don't think um, so either. Yeah. So but would so you add would you add that? Um, and don't tell me we need to do a report because <laughs> reports go nowhere. Um, would you, but would you add that to the list of critical things the legislature ought to be considering and the administration, hoping we get the kind of leadership we need here? Because uh, as you and I have discussed on a number of occasions, it's yeah. I, I think I think one of the you know the critical things of any company, uh, any nonprofit, any you know any organization, is you figure out what you're good at. And uh, and get the most mileage out of it that you possibly can. Uh, with you know, with companies, it's like, what's your product? What's your service? And you know, it, that that becomes your core competency. And and what you then do, you know, for the the, the rest of your company should be built around your, that core competency and and uh, you know, making making a living around it. And I think we ought to be doing the same thing. Yeah, but I don't think it's limited to um, what you're good at or core competency. It's limited to what's good for the the state in general, the economy in general, um, the the use of the state in general, the, the quality of life of, of our people. So it's it's more complicated than um, you know a, a profit corporation um, deciding what what's good in the marketplace because we we have to also consider the people who we are serving. And in government, you know, to me, that's the whole population. Anyway, um, I hope somebody listens to this, Tom. Uh, make them listen, will you? We'll try. <laughs> that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Uh, Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, uh, helping us understand fiscal policy in Hawaii. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show, Jane. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.